in the chat, I just put, and Brooke put it to her amazing essay from Narratively that we talked about before we started recording. It, just so many fantastic, uh, just things yeah. to learn about how to really write um, an intense story, but to write it so well. Yeah. Speaking of intense, how about that agent and querying journey that so much of so many of us are either on right now or have been on or are getting ready to be on uh so welcome everybody to the writer's bridge uh we are so glad to have you and we are back from a month of reruns because we took august off and we hope you enjoyed uh, some of our greatest hits recordings we call it the Writer's Bridge because we talk about building platform and yet a platform is a thing that you stand on and yell at people from. Instead, we want you to think about building a bridge. It's a two-way street where you can reach your readers and your readers can reach right back to you. And ideally, this informs your writing while you inform your readers whether that's nonfiction or fiction, it's something where you have a distinct bond with the people who need your words in the world. So uh, Ashley, what do we well, always say? We always say that we're gonna cover a whole lot. So you should plan to watch this video again. We will send you out a replay link later this week. And um, Ashley, will you start us off with like a fun question of the week? I sure will. Right before that, when we're talking about building bonds, a lot of you are going to be able to bond so much more closely with Alison K. Williams because her book, Seven Drafts, from blank, How to Self-Edit Like a Pro from Blank Page to Book is out in about a week, right, Alison? Yep, coming out in seven days. And uh, the seven publisher days. tells me that because the book turned out to be kind of a fat book, uh, they're gonna raise the price when the book comes out. So it's $2 cheaper right now if you're feeling the pre-order energy. So, uh, and get it. Away. I'm calling it now. I'm calling it now. I think it's going to be the next bird by bird. I think it's going to be a writing craft staple. It is so damn good and so funny. And it's just Allison throughout. Like she's right there. I said, um, you don't even notice that she's holding your feet to the fire because, you know, she's like, we can do this. We can do this. Now get Yay. to work. Here's how to do it. Matt's um, holding up a copy. Matt's got the special large print edition that we brought to Hippo Camp and we downsized the font for the main edition. <laughs> I, I like the heft though. I have one of those copies and I like it. You could because kill burglars with it. You can't. Yes, it could be a good weapon, but it just reminds me of the quality of the information inside. Um, and also bonding. I'm offering one on one coaching. I only have one spot left for 2021. The link is in the email that you got for today. And it will also be in that replay that we have tomorrow. Our question of the week is from Dan, and he asks how best to contact agents when you are already self published. So there are a couple of things here um, to contact an agent to represent a book that you already have published is not the greatest idea. If your book is really making waves and getting notice either in national press or on a fantastic bestseller list, people will come to you. If you had a very good selling first title or you know, previous title, and you would like an agent to represent another title. If you have sold 10,000 copies or more, mentioning that in your query letter is a thumbs up. Because for an agent to see that you were able to build your audience and promote your book and move that many copies will let them know, okay, this person has a platform. They have a connection with their audience. They know who their audience is. They have marketing savvy. They have a lot of things that will be a great selling point when I shop this to editors. If you have sold fewer than say 500 copies, we and say- I'm just gonna say too, like to let everybody know, the average self-published book sells fewer than 100 copies. So if you have self-published and you have sold 100 copies, you are already doing better than most authors. Absolutely. Um, it is totally okay to not mention that book at all in your query letter. And, and we would say if you've sold fewer than 500, 
don't put that on the query letter because we only want things there that are going to be definite uh, marks in the plus column when the agent is looking at you, is looking at that agent or is looking at that query and deciding whether or not they want to request more materials. Um, anything else, anything that could be in the cons column uh, is something that you can have a discussion with, with the agent after they've already decided they love your book. Exactly. Um, if you have self-published a book and you are now looking for an agent, ideally, you want to be looking for an agent for a different book. So write that next book. Um, so Ashley, let's talk a little bit about what our personal journeys have been as far as our agent experiences have gone. Um, do you want to start or do you want me to start? You go first. Okay. So I uh, first queried a memoir back in about 2012, 2013, and I queried 65 agents and three of them requested the full, all of whom were referrals from authors who were my friends, who I had supported their work, and they referred me to their agents. The memoir got representation, and then we spent a year not selling the memoir. Um, about the end of that year, I was at a writing conference and we did one of those things where there's like the, we're going to read the first page of your, your book and the agents will ding the bell when they would stop reading. And they got all the way through my entire first page and the room was very excited and there was like a little pause and then people broke into applause and I thought, oh, this is great. I should build on this momentum by reading some of this unsold book at tonight's student readings. Won't that be fun? And I picked up my manuscript and I leaped through and I was like, boring, boring, porn, boring. Ooh, porn. No way I'm reading that. Boring, boring, porn, boring, boring. And I realized, oh, I wrote this book before I was medicated for clinical depression. And this book reads like somebody with clinical depression wrote it. And that's why the book is not selling because it's just not good enough. And I had put 10 years into that book. So that was very stressful and depressing. But at that point, I had taught myself how to write a book. The next book I worked on, young adult novel, I queried it to 50 or 60 agents, realized it wasn't ready from the feedback I was getting stopped querying, wrote some more on the book. I went to the Writer's Digest conference in New York in, I think it was 2015 or 2016, where they do an agent pitch thing where they release 200 authors into a room for an hour and the room has 40 or 50 agents sitting at tables. They ring a bell every five minutes and you get into a new, new conversation. Um, you had to line up for the agents that you wanted and nobody in there was my dream agent and I was also pitching a travel memoir as well as this young adult novel. So I managed to see 14 agents in 60 minutes because I just went to whoever did not have a line. And the conversations that I got into with those agents about the young adult novel made me realize, oh, the book's still not finished. It needs another three chapters. And then I started querying again. And at that point, I then got feedback from an agent at a conference that it slowed down too much in the middle. And I got feedback that kind of crushed me because an agent named Janet Reed, who is also known as Query Shark, uh, Janet was like, send me your full immediately. I am so excited about this book. I really like it. And about three weeks later, while I was shivering in a hotel room in Darjeeling on New Year's Eve, I got an, a rejection back from her. And it was the first time I had ever truly had my spirit crushed by a rejection. Like I had never before experienced the rejection that makes you go, well, that's it. I'm not a writer. I'm just never going to write anything ever again. I, clearly, this is not my thing. I'm just going to cry for a while. And I've heard from other friends that they've had that experience in rejection for something they really wanted. And I had never previously had that experience. And so karma really like dished me a big helping of empathy that night. And then I looked at the book six weeks later and I realized, oh, these agents were right. It slows down in the middle. Chapter one, girl with gun in cafeteria. Chapter two, girl takes a nap in the library. Chapter three, girl recounts everything we already know to another character. I was like, oh, this book is problematic. And I have spent the past year rewriting it 10 pages a month with my writer's group because it was my back burner project. And I'll start, uh, no, I won't start querying it again. 
because then I wrote the proposal for seven drafts. And at that point, I had spent 10 years building author platform by blogging, by giving out my advice for free, by showing up at conferences to speak, by basically being as nice as I possibly could be to as many people as I could, which does not come naturally to me. Because as my father said to me when I was seven years old, Allison, you're just so goddamn selfish. And I have spent the rest of my life living that down. I queried at that point, I had already queried, I think, almost 200 agents between the two books. And so I figured, okay, screw this. I'm just going to self-publish this sucker. I am so tired of querying. I no longer care. And I pulled up a, a list from Writer's Digest magazine about 20 agents who are now accepting nonfiction. I did the absolute minimum of personalization for each of these agents. I did zero research on them at all. And I fired off 20 queries in an afternoon. And each time I hit send, I said, fuck you, fuck you. You know, cause that was just kind of where I was with querying. And at the last minute, I went ahead and I queried Janet and I said, hey, I know this is probably not your book. You don't really represent how-to nonfiction, but you always say in your blog, go ahead and query because you never know. And I've always liked you. I've always admired and respected you. I would really love it if you took a look at my book. And she emailed me back 45 minutes later and said, call me now. And I did not realize that Janet had not actually read the proposal that I had attached to my email until we started working on the book. She wanted to represent me based on query and concept and the platform that I had. And then from there, we sold that book to a small press. And so Janet now represents me after rejecting both the memoir in my initial querying phase and the young adult novel and now she's going to represent the young adult novel because now she's my agent. So it kind of, you know, came around from there. In the long run, I spent probably 10 years querying and then I got an agent in two weeks. So it really is kind of all that time that you put in that, that adds up to, okay, now I am ready for that moment of seemingly spontaneous success. So that's been my agent journey. Ashley, what's your agent journey been? So my query journey is quicker than Allison's because I retired from my career in figure skating to be a writer. So I was like, this has got to happen quickly because as my colleagues are winning medals this next season, I need to have a book deal. Okay. So um, no pressure, no pressure, right? One year after I started my memoir, I actually had two agent offers. So it did happen really quickly. Two months before that, I um, had my first full request. So I, <laughs> so funny, but I'm going to say it. I queried three agents on my first day and I turned notifications on for my phone for Gmail because I wanted to remember how many minutes it took to get my first full request. Yeah, it wasn't minutes. But the first agent to request it was Margaret Riley King from WME and she's Glennon Doyle's agent. And she rejected it two months later. And I, I, I cried for about eight weeks and I could not look at my manuscript without intense self-loathing. And that's when I realized that I really needed to be medicated for the depression and anxiety that I've had since I was 11, but just figure, skate, figure skating keeps you busy enough to distract yourself and everyone else around you from that realization. So I say Lexapro is my developmental editor. So I took the feedback that Margaret Riley King had given me and my, my newly uh, steady way of um, going through my days and I rewrote the whole thing and added 22,000 words of detail and dialogue. I was really afraid that my book, a story about how as a perfectionist mom, I took doing it all to the next level as the world's worst attempted swinger was too much right out of the gate. So the whole book was telling the story with like a gloss of apology for actually living the story at the same time. And Margaret had said, I just wanted more. I just wanted more and I thought, okay, green light, let's go. And so the version she had didn't have any sexy details. Like it really was, it really was different than the book that got published. That better 
manuscript and a much better query letter because I, I would have paid quadruple uh, what I paid to get the feedback I got from Jane Friedman. I had a 10 week waiting period to get feedback on my query and my first pages of my summary it cost me like $400 in 10 weeks. And when I sent that to her um, was right the same week that I got the rejection from Margaret. And I thought if I don't have an agent in 10 weeks, like I don't know how I can survive. Like the anxiety and the pressure I'd put on myself was so intense. Um, I was certain that I would, I, it was, it was bad. It was bad. I was gonna say I would never write again, but it was like a little darker than that. And I'm not saying this because um, querying inherently will cause these problems, but querying is one of the most stressful periods of our life. So unresolved issues will, will rise up, will rise up. Um, you know, during any real stressor in our lives uh, that can happen and querying the intensity of it, I don't want to, you know, it's a privileged place to be in, to be working on a, something that you want published and to send it, but the stress of it is not a joke. So having a support system is really great. Um, I got two agent offers within a few weeks of sending out the new query. I signed with the one who was the most excited about my book. Um, I found the experience of being represented by an agent to be over underwhelming, underwhelming. I had always run my own business. I had experience, 20 years experience recruiting for a sport that people don't know exists, which is synchronized skating. Uh, so my sales ability and my pitching and my way to market was quite developed over all of those years. Um, Working with skating parents can give you a crash course on human psychology and how to really appeal and make somebody believe that you are going to help them. So uh, my agent gave me really no feedback on how she was going to submit. She just wanted me to sign with her immediately because she wanted to start submitting the next day, which was exciting because I thought, okay, yeah, remember I put the notifications on for my phone. Yes, maybe Random House is going to respond within, a, you know, within the hour. Um, because this person, this, this agent really was very, very excited about my book. So excited that I don't know if she really strategized how to pitch it really well. Uh, it was on submission for five months. She got a lot of no replies from editors, which makes me think maybe she wasn't as connected as I was hoping she would be. Um, and she, she really didn't get the results she thought. She thought that we would have the Canadian, the Canadian rights sold within days and then a bidding war for the US rights the next week. She really, really did think it was going to go quickly. Uh, I decided partly because of my great relationship with Allison uh, that I wanted a relationship that got more done with more ease and better communication than what my agent was able to offer. And I broke up with her on the eve of my 40th birthday. That was my birthday present to myself. I am going to break up with my agent and we'll see what comes next. Well, over the next 45 days, I wasn't allowed to contact any other agents. And at that point, I thought, you know what? I have been trying so hard on social media for so many years. I am just going to do what is fun because I don't have that fear right now that the next thing I post may like blacklist me from an agent or editor, agent or editor, or I'm not like, oh, I hope this next thing I post goes viral. So somebody does want to work with me. I'm like, I'm just going to post things that are fun. And my audience grew by 55,000 people in 45 days, just by me doing what was fun, because I realized that's when my audience can really see me. And then I decided I don't want an agent. I really love learning things because I like teaching them to other people and strategizing ways that, that the things I've learned can be applicable to all different other situations that people are trying to do, whether you're trying to publish uh, with, with, whether you're publishing with a small press or big five, or you're publishing independently. I thought, you know what, I really want to learn more about this industry. And I think the way to do that is to hold all the risk and all the reward myself and self-publish this book, which I'm very, very happy about. And has then worked her tail off as far as promoting said book. So how do you know you're ready to query? At what stage are you ready to get that book out there? Well, your book needs to be in sellable shape, which for fiction means it's done. It's polished, 
You have had other people read it. You have potentially had either a professional copy editor or a sharp-eyed friend go over it because no, an agent is not going to reject your book for typos, but it's a speed bump in their reading. It puts them off their stride. And so it's really useful for that manuscript to be as clean as possible. You want your book to be as finished as possible as well because you only get to query an agent once for one book. If they turn down that book, you cannot query them again with the same book, even if you do a massive rewrite on the book, unless they have specifically said, if you revise this, please query this again. If you are writing nonfiction, your book may or may not need to be finished, but you do need to have crackerjack sample chapters that are in sellable shape. And the less book you have, the more platform you need. And so Diane asks, I get the sense that agents are not interested in any writer who does not have platform. Will they even read your query without some platform? Well, if your book is fiction, platform doesn't matter. Fiction does not sell on platform. Fiction sells on the quality of the writing and the value of the story. Uh, and so remember that quality of the writing does not mean high level literary for every single book. Quality of the writing means it appeals to the audience it's meant for. Twilight sold like gangbusters. Is it a beautifully written book? It is not, but there is something compelling about that story that made people want to read it. And so know that if your goal is literary fiction, yeah, you're gonna have to write as well as you possibly can. But if your goal is popular fiction, the power of your story is every bit as important as the quality of your writing. If you're querying nonfiction, chances are good you're gonna end up needing a proposal. Um, we have talked lots about proposal. There are lots of resources about proposals. They are a pain in the ass to write, but they can be very, very helpful to memoirists and to people writing narrative nonfiction because they will help you finish the book and they will help you know how to market the book. Either way, you're going to need to show your most polished work that you are capable of selling at this time and you need to show the strongest opening pages you possibly can. Pages that make the agent go, oh man, I can't wait to see more of what this is about. Melissa asks about querying a collection of personal essays. Do you still need a proposal if the book is complete? Um, very often you're gonna need a proposal even if the book is complete because some agents want to see your proposal before they see your manuscript. And you're gonna need the proposal for the agent to sell it to a publisher. So you might as well go ahead and start writing the proposal. Um, the thing that most helps sell a collection of personal essays is writing a viral essay. And I, I queried my memoir uh, with the full manuscript without a proposal. And um, I was never asked for a proposal. And my agent took it on submission without a pro pro proposal. I think that these are some of the reasons that I wasn't sure my agent and I were on the same page. Um, because when you just have the full manuscript and the agent says, I love it. And you go, oh, I'm so glad you love it because I love it too. Uh, we maybe weren't talking about loving the same things. And with a proposal, you can clearly say, you can clearly see how the book is going to be pitched, what communities you think it's going to reach, where you think it is shelved in a store, where you think it fits in the marketplace. And I think I, if I would have had that proposal written, uh, then at least the agent could have said to me, oh, I agree with this. I don't agree with that. And I think that it would have put us on the same page more easily. Exactly. Um, Deborah asks for a narrative memoir. What do you suggest when a proposal and three chapters, should they be grouped or dispersed throughout the manuscript? You almost always want to include your first chapter because if your first chapter isn't the best or the second best chapter in the book, there's a problem with your first chapter and you need to cut it or you need to rewrite it. You know, if you if you can't put that first chapter in a proposal, why on earth would you expect anyone to buy your book? You know, people open to the front pages. Uh, Deborah, you'll have to fill us in on why you think uh, you can't uh, do the first chapter in there. I would say put in your first chapter and your strongest chapter. And if there's a chapter that's different in style or tone, put that one in as well. Um, the best way to sell your essay collection is to write a hot essay. And for that, I would recommend uh, looking up Susan Shapiro and reading the Byline Bible. Uh, she's got some great stuff about 
getting your, getting your work out there into the world in a way that attracts people. And Phyllis asked, how is publishing a book of poetry different from publishing a novel? Well, you're probably not gonna need an agent because there's no money in poetry. And I say that with great love and respect for poetry, but 15% of nothing is nothing. So it's not really worth it for an agent to represent you. If you become an established poet, chances are really good that agents will seek you out based on your literary output. Um, but remember that Maggie Smith spent a crap ton of time on Twitter and Instagram before Keep Moving hit big. And she also got good bones into the West Wing. And so a unique set of circumstances combined to make her an agentable poet and a poet who was capable of getting a big five book deal. Hear from Andrea and Rachel in the chat that are actually a little related, I think. Um, Andrea says, I got an agent last summer and my narrative nonfiction book went out on proposal in the late fall to five editors from the big five. Um, so only to five editors, right? They all turned it down, with, with, but with kind words and good feedback. My agent thinks the book's focus needs to change, but I'm not really interested in writing the books she's suggesting. Not sure what to do. Any insights? So five editors getting back is not a huge sample size. Um, the book is going to be better if you have your heart in it. Maybe talk to your agent about sending it out to a sampling of a few more, maybe three more editors and see what they say. I would guess once you start writing and the agent sees this, what your agent is suggesting for you, what if you tried to do that and then change the book you really wanted to, the, in the way you really wanted to, and showed those chapters to your agent? If the book is coming more alive and getting better, then the agent is probably going to have more confidence in your idea. And yeah, don't write the book that your agent is pushing you to write if that's not the book you want to write, but it might be worth spending a couple of weeks giving it a try because you agreed to work with them because you thought they knew the market and how to sell your book. So it might be worth trying to see if that has any resonance for you. And if not, you're either going to have to change agents or write another book. And in, in my experience with choreography, sometimes doing a thing that I'm certain is not going to work because a judge suggested it or an assistant coach wants to try it was the absolute necessary path to getting to the thing that was going to work. So like Allison said, giving it a try, um, sometimes going in a different direction will slingshot you back in the right direction. And then both of you can feel good about the way that you got there. Rachel exactly. asks, can you speak to genre confusion? I've written a memoir slash expose and I'm told that the genre confusion is an issue. How many books seem to be more than one genre? What I hear when somebody says something like this is, I don't know how our booksellers are going to convince a bookstore to buy this because they don't know what shelf it goes on. They don't know what the other competing titles are gonna be there. So when someone says genre, think of bookstore and how it is shelved. If you can make um, a reason for why it should be right beside David Sedaris, then make that reason. Just think of the bookstore. And that's why a proposal can help as well for you to clarify those ideas. Because when you pull out your comp titles, you'll know which shelf your book should be on. And you'll be able to position your book in the query and in the proposal to say, this is where the book belongs. So where the heck do you find all these agents? Well, there's a couple of big sources. You're going to look for Manuscript Wish List. It is a Twitter hashtag, MSWL, and it's also a website, Google Manuscript Wish List, and it pops right up. It is primarily fiction, and it's heavily young adult, but it does have agents representing other things, and it's a great place to look and see what are people specifically looking for. And if you follow that hashtag on Twitter, very often agents will ask for something incredibly specific. Like I saw one a couple of months ago that was, I need a travel memoir from a woman of color traveling alone. And so that's something that hey, maybe you're the person who wrote that and you need to pop that into that agent's mailbox right away. There are two big websites, Agent Query and Query Tracker um, that are very useful and list agents. And some of them also keep track of how long does this agent typically take to respond. Ideally, you want to look up all of your agents long before you actually need to query. Because if you look up, say, 
three agents a week and you Google them and you see what they've said in interviews and you read about when they are open for queries and when they are not, and you log that information in your Excel spreadsheet, by the time you're actually ready to query the book, you've got a list of 60 or 70 agents. And then you can be happy when agent 40 represents your full instead of depressed when agent number nine sends you a rejection and that was the end of your list. It's really worth it to gradually accumulate as many people as possible, because then you're also going to know who to recommend to your friends when they start querying, you know, which is not a referral, but like you can say, oh, hey, I read that this agent is looking for a book like yours. You should query that agent. Yeah, Meredith, I would say 60 um, or even, you know, as many as you can do uh, between the young adult and the memoir and the nonfiction. I have a query list of probably 200 agents. I probably queried close to 100 of them. We're also going to share with you guys, I have a Twitter list that is usually private, but I will public it for about 48 hours after you get the specific instructions that you will get. And that Twitter list has a thousand agents on it. And so you can click through and add that list to your Twitter. We'll give you specific instructions on how to do that. And you'll be able to see, oh, hey, this agent might be the right one for me. There's a lot more agents out there than you might suspect. Ashley, where else should people find agents? I, really, I find great value in my publisher's marketplace subscription. I am really snoopy. So when I hear that a new book's coming out, I want to know who the agent was, who the acquiring editor was, maybe some indication of the deal size and when it's publishing. I want, or, or if it's publishing now, when did that book sell? I want to know all of those things because I'm, I'm new to this industry. I want to understand how things work. I want to understand who runs in the same circles. So what I did was when I made my first list of 30 top agents, I then went to who they represent, which is a list on Publishers Marketplace that isn't updated that often, but it is a list in one spot that I'm already paying for. And I followed almost every one of their authors on social media on every platform I could find really quickly. I found I resonated with some and I didn't resonate with others. Um, but that started to give me an idea of who the communities were, who's blurbing each other, who, who's writing do I really resonate with and I want to support their books. So that really helped me understand uh, just the, the layout, the landscape of the relationships in publishing as well. Exactly, exactly. If you are querying from overseas, and that was a question that we got, if you are Australian and you want to query in the UK, if you are American and you want to query in Canada, usually your, your agent, your book needs to have some kind of connection to where the agent is. So for example, one of my friends is a citizen of New Zealand. He lives in Dubai. He is of Iraqi heritage, but he is querying agents in London because his book is set in London. And uh, it's a modern retelling of uh, uh, Pride and Prejudice called Pride and Pistachio Cake about hot young millennial Arabs in London. And it's fascinating. It's real. And, and so it's connected to that. I'm going to take a quick second and share screen with you guys to show you what your agent tracker uh, sheet might look like. I keep it in Excel. You could also keep it in Google Sheets. You could keep it on a piece of paper. Um, but what you can see here is I've listed, okay, from the Gernert agency, here's Seth Fishman. He wants a YA query plus your first 20 pages. I queried him on the 3rd of February, 2017. He referred me to a colleague and gray means he has rejected me. Uh, oh, look, Veronica Park never did get back to me from Corvisario. Yellow as they have the full. All of these grays are rejections. All of these blues are people who I thought might be a good person to, uh, a good person to query. Um, I list agents who I don't want to query as well, because that way I don't have to look them up twice if I come across them again. Also, whenever I look up an agent, I also look at who else is at their agency and is the agency, if one of us refuses, no, everybody refuses, because if they don't say that, you can query other people at the agency. So as you can see here, lots more rejection. 
Um, I, I got some feedback from Kent D. Wolf because uh, I bought feedback from him at a charity auction. And uh, boy, did he ever hate my book a lot. Um, but there was a political situation at the time that was personal for him and that made him hate my book a lot. His feedback was not helpful or useful, but he's a fantastic agent. He represents friends of mine and I've recommended him to other friends of mine because I know him to be good. He's Carmen Maria Machado's agent. So just because an agent doesn't wanna represent you doesn't make them a bad agent for your friend. So keep track of all those people. I love that. My list is almost identical to Allison's and I haven't seen Allison's until today. When you research the agents, pull all the pertinent information. Um, Jane Distal, Jane Distal, she has her own agency. She's been in the game for a very long time, was a figure skater as a child. So that is how I led my email. And that is why Jane was one of the first people to get back to me about around the same time that Margaret did. Um, because also there was another, uh, um, I think it was Rebecca Gradinger who maybe represents um, some people here or in our binder. Uh, she's from Montreal and has two daughters. So anybody who had a Canadian, because I'm a Canadian living in the US or a sports similarity, I wrote down those little things for the personalization. Carrie asks, how do I follow manuscript wish lists so that those tweets come up in my feed rather than just searching for it? Ashley, oh, you're not the Twitter person. Why would I ask you? I'm pretty sure that somebody knows how to sign up to follow a hashtag list. Um, if you know how, please put the instructions in the chat. Laura what asks, I find, oh, sorry, ahead, what Ashley. I find on manuscript wish list, and I didn't use it for a long period of time because I actually just found out about manuscript wish list during my second round of querying. Um, that on the website, the tweets update, like if you go to the manuscript wish list uh, website, and I found that was far more concise and easy to follow than just searching it on Twitter. Laura asks, when an agent doesn't list their turnaround time, I typically assume it's a rejection if I haven't heard from them in three months. Is that reasonable or is the timeline longer due to COVID-19? Right now, the timeline is a little bit longer. Um, sometimes agents get back to you in a couple of weeks. Sometimes they get back to you in a couple of days. Rejections are often faster than acceptances. It is not uncommon for an agent to sit on your full manuscript that they have requested for as long as a year, which is why you should keep querying even when an agent requests your full, even when an agent requests pages, keep querying because one of the things that makes agents read your work faster is when another agent is interested. So when Janet said to me, hey, I really wanna represent this book, Seven Drafts, that means I immediately get to contact the other 19 agents who I had just queried and said, hey, I have received an offer of representation. I'm still interested in you. Are you still interested in me? Let me know. And at that point, the people who had the full went ahead and read it quickly. Then also the people who knew it was a reject went ahead and rejected me quickly. I have a couple of friends, this has happened to more than one person I know, where they had five or six agents who had requested their full. The agents had had it for six, seven, eight months. She had you know, nudged it three months, nudged it six months got nothing. And then all of a sudden an agent said, hey, I'd like to represent you. So she resent the original query, adding to the subject line, offer of rep received. And at that point, four more agents read the book in 48 hours and three of them wanted to represent her. And so she got to interview four agents and go, okay, who is the best fit for me? Which brings us to what are you going to ask an agent when you do that call? Um, we are going to share with you a uh, cheat sheet from book coach Allison Lane, who has also been popping up in the chat. Thank you, Allison. We're so glad you're here. That has a list of agent questions to ask. But what else would we ask? A Ashley, what did you ask agents when you started talking to them? So I had two agent calls and they were both offers of rep. Um, just to add in another little piece here, the my first offer of representation was from a junior agent at an agency. I had queried the head of the agency and they bumped it to her right away and said, I think this is a better fit for this agent. And so when I followed up 
And she asked for the full that day because her boss had just said, hey, I think this is a good book for you. Okay. So there's like a little bit of a fire underneath her. So four weeks later, when I emailed and said, hey, you know what? I didn't request receipt, like confirmation of receipt for that attached full manuscript. I just wanted to make sure you got it. She read the book. She didn't respond right away. And I said, I, it's because she's reading the book. 48 hours later, she said, I did get it. I loved it. I'd like to talk on the phone with you. So that's when I nudged everybody, even people who I had queried eight weeks before and had never, they hadn't asked for any materials. They hadn't even confirmed they got it. And I got four more full requests then. And people read it within 48 hours, just like Allison said. Agents are fast readers when they have a reason to read. Otherwise, they're just going to have it to the side. Um, when I was on the phone, I asked the standard questions. What, where do you see this book? How would you pitch it? What um, are we going to do if I don't sell the book? Uh, and they told me like they would help me with rewrites or this or that. The agent that I signed with said, that's impossible. We are selling this book, which ding, ding, should have been a red flag. Um, also asking them about um, whether they have editorial feedback. This is a really, really, really big one. You will Not probably all agents are editorial agents. Some of them want to say to you, fix this, this, and this, and you go away and you fix it yourself and come back. Other agents want to read it thoroughly and give you a crap ton of notes, or they might even have their assistant read it thoroughly before they read it thoroughly and you fix the assistant notes first. You also want to ask them, am I going to be working primarily with you? Will I be working with an assistant? Um, Deb asks a great question in the chat about, does it matter if it's a junior agent or a senior agent? You know, and she says, it's a little bit weird to query people who are young enough to be my kid. Welcome okay. to the wonderful world of literary agents. There's this, there's this, I really, really loved that a junior agent, it was bumped to a junior agent because that's how I got my offer. And that's how I nudged the other dozens and dozens of agents who had it, okay? Um, I know that agent would have been more receptive to my concerns and had better communication with me uh, over the next five months than the agent I signed with. Um, if I had that younger agent, maybe we would have worked on the proposal together and we would have sold that to a publisher. I have no regrets about the path that I, that I took, but there are, there are some big benefits to having a junior agent. You should ask yourself, do you want to be a little fish in a big pond or do you want to be the big fish? Do you want to be like their client who they're like, okay, this is, this is my great client who I'm going to like put so much work and time into to get their book just perfect because they want to do a good job for their boss, right? Maybe they even want a promotion. Um, there's a lot of eagerness there that can actually turn into results. And also, Allison, having a more experienced, you have one of the most experienced agents in the game. So what do you see as the benefit there? Um, it is valuable to know people who know people. Agents don't have to live in New York anymore, especially since COVID, but even prior to COVID, so much was going online. But it is incredibly valuable to have your agent know people. They've had lunch with those editors. Agenting right now is this really interesting mix of women over 60 and women under 30 and not a whole lot of people in between because either you learn how to make money at it because agents work for free until they sell your book. Agents put in hundreds of hours of labor before they sell your book. And that's one of the reasons why so many agents don't respond to your query or they send a form letter because yeah, it would only take 30 seconds to copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste those rejections, but that's not her primary job. Her primary job is representing her existing clients, which also brings us to a wonderful question from Claudine in the thing. How long should I be waiting for feedback from my agent? And there was also a really great question sent to us in advance about, you know, what should I do if I need to break up with my agent? So one of the challenges is if you have a different vision for your book or your agent wants you to write a different book than you think you're writing or your book's not selling and you don't know if it's the book or if the agent isn't powerful enough to sell your book or your agent is not communicating. If you didn't do something new, they don't need to talk to you. 
if they've got your manuscript in progress, you need to get a timeline from them on when they think they're going to respond to you. But there also does come a point where you have to look around and go, okay, I don't actually have an agent right now. I have a person who is stopping me from getting another agent. Um, I was working with a client who her agent was not getting back to her. And then they said, okay, well, I've got another book that's very similar to your book. And I want to shop that book first before I shop your book, because yours is, you know, still getting into some revisions. And it's like, okay, so right now you don't have an agent. You have a person who is making you wait in line so that maybe they will act like your agent later when they are done being somebody else's agent. And it's this really weird balance where technically the agent works for you, but the agent is the most desirable babysitter in town. And she's not coming to your house unless you've got good snacks and Netflix. So there's that weird balance of how much can you get from them? So I, I have good communication with my agent. She's pretty good about returning emails but I got a pretty low advance. And so I don't feel right about bothering her very often because I feel like I'm not making any money for her yet. The advantage to a low advance is that my book has probably already earned out on pre-orders. Earning out is when you start getting royalties. But I also don't really feel like I can do a lot of nudging because I don't feel like I'm making any money for anybody yet. And that's a really weird feeling. And that's something that you might end up navigating as well but know that you have the right to ask them to return your emails, to take a call, to say, hey, can you at least give me a time frame? What kind of communication should I be expecting from you and when? Mm -hmm. um, a contract with the agent, Andrea asks, yes, there should be a written contract for every agreement to offer representation. Um, I've heard, I've seen in a couple binders, people saying, oh, my agent, they just, you know, good faith agreement, gentleman's handshake or whatever it is. No, you need, you need um, it in writing, the contract. It will tell you on there things like any editor that the agent has submitted to, even if you break up with the agent, if that editor offers a deal within a year, the commissions go back to the agent. There are all of these things, like they do have some breadth, they do have some hold on you while they are offering to work for you on spec because they don't get any money until they sell your book and you get paid, okay? So it is all work on spec. Um, what, the contract will also say is um, if you want to break the contract, how many days have to transpire afterwards before you could get representation from someone else. My agency contract said 45 days. Uh, for anything that you do not understand, feel free to ask your agent. They may bump you to their contracts department of their agency to talk. Uh, you could even ask a lawyer to look over it. There was nothing in mind that was so concerning that that would be the case. Yeah. So we are going to take a minute and pop you guys into some breakout rooms so that you can meet each other and say hello. Uh, just take a Welcome quick on. back from the breakout rooms. I know there are still more questions that we did not get to everything about. You are going to be getting some resources in the follow-up email, which will come out with a link to the replay. It will also come out with a link to the wonderful book coach, Allison Lane, who has very kindly shared two goodie bag sheets for you, one of which is a series of like like fill in the blank sentences to personalize your query, like different ways to approach the agent to go, hey, I'm connected to you. And also a list of questions you should ask an agent when you first have that phone call about, hey, do we want to work together? You're also going to get a link to and instructions on how to copy my Twitter list of agents to your Twitter. We're going to give you a real specific step-by-step -step set of instructions. So don't freak out about that. And it'll come to you in the next little while. Ashley, what is your top tip for us as we move back into the wonderful world of querying? I think understand, understanding the publishing landscape and also understanding the way you work. Um, for me, growing up in figure skating, anyone who has some sort of, a, some sort of judgment that's going to affect how I proceed, for me, feels like an authority figure, even though an agent is a partner, is actually a partner. 
Um, and an editor it would also be a partner in, in a little bit lesser of a way, but also a partner. Um, it is mo far more comfortable more comfortable for me to fail publicly than to have an authority figure tell me that's not good enough or you can't do this or you can't do this yet you need to wait till I tell you what you can do. As a competitor and as a coach I would fall on my ass in front of thousands of people on a regular basis and as a professional my teams would travel across the country and their parents would lay out tens of thousands of dollars for there to be a big train wreck on the ice. Failing publicly is not a big deal for me. But when that, um, when somebody who I'm supposed to be working with and trusting gives me negative feedback, it is soul crushing. And yes, I work on this with my therapist on a regular basis. Go into your querying process. I wanna remind you all that what you create is beautiful and valuable regardless of the level of outside affirmation you receive. So one of the things that I say in not the current book, but the previous book is imagine that you are blue. You are the blue of beautiful skies. You are the blue of gorgeous mountains. You are the blue of the rolling ocean. They might want red. And there is nothing you can do about that. And it doesn't make you wrong or bad or not the right person. It just means that your work was not the right fit for one person at one specific time. So love your writing, do what you can to get your words into the world because out there are readers who need your words in their life. Our next meeting is gonna be September 14th. If you are on the list, you will get the link. You don't need to sign up again. Um, our next meeting is going to be talking about indie bookstores. How do you get to indie bookstores? How do you get them to carry your book? What if it's self-published? What if it's traditionally published? Does Hey, I Grew Up in This Town have any currency anymore? How can you partner with indie bookshops to help sell their books as well as them selling your book? And we're going to talk about that with some particular indie booksellers as well. We're so glad to have you guys back. Please unmute yourselves for a beautiful goodbye. And thanks for coming to meet us on the Writer's Bridge. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.